you would stand with us, we're going to begin with a time of worship and get going this morning. You may have a seat. Good morning and welcome to Spring Creek online and in person. And as most of you noticed, your bulletin is upside down. That is not my fault. I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just want everybody to know. So um, this last week's going to be the pretty much last week of um, all the fun stuff that goes on around here for a while. Um, Wednesday night we're having the big um, wet party, summer kickoff water party for um, all the kids. Um, tonight we're having a business meeting. So, yeah. We get ice cream. We need lots of chocolate ice cream. Um, let me see. Gina, it's Gina's birthday on the 24th. Hey, Gina, happy birthday. Um, Bob Thomas, he's on the 24th. Pastor Mike, his birthday is going to be Saturday, so if you see him this week, you got to tell him happy birthday. And Jan Chaplin, it's her birthday on the same day as Pastor Mike. That's awesome. Today's 29th. Oh, 29th, my bad. I did do that one then. <laughs> okay, and as most of you know, the office hours are going to, uh, has changed from um, 8 to 12, but pretty much sometimes we're still here till four or five. So you could just check. Uh, we still have the baby bottle campaign going on, so be sure and grab some bottles and fill them up with money. And let's stand up and love each other, hug each other. <laughs>
We are going to um, slight change of plans. We're going to begin our time of worship first and then do our graduate recognition after our time of worship. So if you would stand and join with us as we worship. the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand my hope is built on nothing in Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest grace, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Lord of all. 
seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within. shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless I stand before the throne. Faultless I stand before the throne. Christ
safely to arrive at home. Jesus brought me when stranger wandering from the fold one came to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter by my wandering heart to be prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my opportunity to worship you this morning. Father, we praise you for these graduates that we're celebrating this morning. We're recognizing. We pray that you will do a mighty work in their life, that you, you will be with them as they grow and develop and they learn more about you. And we pray that you would be ever present in their life, no matter where they are right now in their walk with you. Father, we pray that as our school years close and we go into our summers, that we would not let the desire to share your love go away, that we would find opportunities in the adventures we go on this summer to share your love and to help others grow a relationship with you. And to that, Lord, we pray that you would grow our hearts with you. Build a relationship for us with you that would stop power will be known. Because it's all about you. It's not about us. Well, the, the kids can hang with us for just a second. So, or not, or they're going to leave, so that's fine. Well, hey, uh, they don't want to say, they don't want to hear about graduation. They want to say kids forever, right? So, um, on a side note, real quick, um, we love to celebrate special days, and so what we're doing is we're celebrating our graduates, although I think we only have one in the sanctuary right now. Um, and one is on his way. But with that all said, we also have a very special uh, day today as well. So I got permission to do this. So I'm sorry. Oh, Jazz Gould. So I had a conversation with Jazz Gould this morning, and she said that I'm scary. So um, I'm not that scary, I promise. So now she just slunk down in her chair. So today is the 10 year anniversary of when the Burkettes are able to uh, finally. Uh, adopt Jazz Ghoul. So it is her gotcha day. It's their gotcha day. So. An ocean separated them, but now they are one family. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So 
Uh, when I was a young man and I graduated from high school, uh, my youth leader gave me a book called The Places You Will Go. And maybe for you graduates, maybe you have gotten one of those uh, books at this time. But Dr. Seuss wrote this and based in his children's book, but it says this. It says, oh, the places you will go. And so this is by Dr. Seuss. He says, uh, I took a couple excerpts here. So it says, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have the brains in your head. You have uh, feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own way, and you know what and you uh, and you know what you know, and you are the guy who will decide where to go. So, and then he, uh, further on in the book, he says, So be sure when you step, to step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three-quarter percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. And so that's from, from Dr. Seuss. Uh, today we celebrate, we have four graduates in our, in our congregation. So, um, it, so if I understand this correctly, there are individual pictures, right, of these kids? So let's see, who, who, who's up first? So Stephen Groot graduated yesterday, so he's not with us this morning, but he is here. I don't, I'm trying to remember what high school he graduated from. Washington High School in Conroe. So, and then next up we have Jeremy Hustis. He graduated from the uh, H- uh, Hustis Academy of Conroe. So, <laughs> if, if you catch the joke, that's great. So, the real funny story real quick. So, he is uh, a, a surprising trip. Kind of the family is all together one last time. They surprised him, and they're in Disney World. And when we asked for a picture, she's like, all of them are at, uh, Jill said, all of them are at home. So, here, take this one, and this is what we use. So... <laughs> Apparently, he's having that much fun in the world's greatest place on earth, or the funnest place on earth, whatever they call themselves anyway. So let's see, who else do we have next year? Tyler. Tyler is on his way, so he's, he's here. He's in the parking lot. So this is what we'll do, right? Everybody just wait, and when he walks in, everybody turn and point. No, I'm just, we, we, can, we can still do that, but we we we, we told, we'll still do that but let's call up our other graduate here we actually do have so drew so this is where you get embarrassed i, I promise you i'm not going to ask you about what future come on, come on, they want to see you there you go. So, so I'm not going to ask you about what your future plans are. So you graduated from, was it Oak Ridge? Correct. So you graduated from Oak Ridge yesterday. And so as a token of recognition of this coming Wednesday. Okay. But, but other people graduated yesterday, right? Okay. See, so Conroe ISD, you got to get your act together. What's going on, right? All right. They only use one. Pl- okay. So Stinks for you. Apparently, you, you still have to be in school. Other people have graduated. Anyway, regardless, Drew, we are excited on your, your next step in life here. And like I said, I'm not going to ask you unless you want to share what is next in life. But regardless, what we do is going out into the world, we know that it can be kind of a big and scary place. And so what we want to do is we want to equip you. So what we do is we give all our graduates a Bible. And so this has your name on it, and you get to keep that as appreciation and recognition of what you've done. Uh, you have made it through, so congratulations. So give Drew a round of applause. <laughs> have, have, have a seat. So there you go. So, all right. So I just do I vamp another minute here or not? All right. So anyway, so anyway, so Tyler graduated as well. So apparently his school is mean, is nicer than Drew's, who is mean, and he's you know, Tyler. <laughs> Ty, so so. So, t- t- so they do one a night, and apparently Tyler won. So he got the lottery, so he got the first. So he doesn't have to go to school anymore. So, um, all right. So anyway, so how y'all doing? <laughs> I remember when I graduated, I really wanted to throw my hat, but it was in a Catholic, it was in a Catholic church because I got, went from a Catholic high school. So everybody point and look. Ah! So this is what, come on up. So this is what you get for being late, Tyler. So Tyler, we've had a great conversation about you thus far, but come on up. You, you, got, you got to be embarrassed. So Tyler, apparently you won the lottery is what we heard. Uh, apparently. 
Yeah, apparently, because you uh, don't have to go to school ever again. Poor Drew, though, however, has to, so. He doesn't? Why do you let me do this? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> All right, anyway, so Tyler, uh, so you graduated from Conroe High School? Conroe High School, so um, so I... I I was I, I let Drew off the hook. Any big plans for the future? Uh, probably go into the military. Go into the military, but not sure yet. So anyway, as you go on your way, what we want to do is we want to give you a Bible. And Drew, this also co- uh, goes for you as well. I know that this world has a lot of tough questions and a lot of hard questions. And one of the things at our church that we're passionate about is trying to not only equip our graduates, but also you all. So what we do is we've given you an apologetic study Bible. So in there you'll find those hard questions about life and everything. And we want to give this as a token and a recognition of your graduations. Con- uh, graduate, you only graduated once, so congratulations. Congratulations, everybody. Clap for Tyler here. So. All right. With that said, kids... You can be dismissed now. And the, we already had worship, and so whoever is the scripture reader is going to come forward and read. For those who have graduated and still have questions, see my wife. She knows everything. (laughs) I'll pay for that later. (laughs) Our reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as it is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covenous man who is an adulterer has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So this part I know how to do. So, all right. So, I doubt you know this name, but you might. Are you familiar with a guy by the name of Lou Bloom? Probably not. Lou Bloom was an incredibly successful uh, stage performer uh, and vaudeville actor. Uh, He was said to be the inspiration of characters, as we know, as Charlie Chaplin and W.C. Fields. Uh, During his successful career, he became an art lover, and he purchased many, many paintings around the turn uh, of the, I guess it would be the 20th century, like 1900s. He was in the the bridge between the 1800s and the 1900s. And so he bought many pieces of art and really enjoyed it. And 20 years after his... Uh, acting career kind of came to end. And what I mean by kind of came to the end was basically he did the same character for years and years and years, and everybody just kind of got bored of him and said, man, this is the worst act on the, on the bill, when it used to be the best act on the bill. And so as a result, it, his, his, his career just kind of abruptly kind of aided and faded off into obscurity. So during his time, he began to acquire pieces of art, and he had all these things. And as he was doing this, um, he beca- uh, came into his possession the, uh, a famous painting, which was a painting of Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, commi- it was a, uh, the, this painting uh, is, was a significant piece of history. Supposedly, um, the, the, the story behind the painting is this, is that Mary Todd wanted to c- 
commissioned a special painting to surprise Abraham Lincoln on his birthday. And so there was a painter at the time who lived in the White House, and he, he, she asked him to paint the painting, and, and he obliged to paint the painting, only to re- realize that Mary Todd didn't really have any access to money because it was the 1800s, and so no way to pay without Abraham Lincoln knowing. She told him to destroy the painting. I cannot pay for it. Well... The artist wasn't going to just destroy a hard piece of work, and so he kept it and sold it to a a, a big fan of Abraham Lincoln. He was a businessman, he was a shipbuilder, and he had the money, and so it was sold uh, to this man. And this man, basically, when he passed away, it was carried, uh, it was passed down to uh, his daughter, and his daughter just so happened to need a nurse, and that nurse was the sister of Lou Bloom. And so Lou Bloom's sister, this painting was then passed to her, and when uh, Lou Bloom's sister passed away, the, the painting came to him. And he had this amazing piece of artwork that seemed to be unknown and lost to history. And so he, in turn, sold it to a a surviving, I guess it was the great-grandchild of Abraham Lincoln, and sold it back to the Lincoln family for what would be now, in today's money, somewhere of around thirty-two dollars to $47,000, depending on inflation. Although, if you wait another hour, it'll probably go up to fifty. Who knows? So, this painting then become this great play, and eventually, this, this, fa- uh, this family relative, this uh, uh, artwork was then, the uh, who, who art collection, took this painting and donated it in 1976 to the Illinois State Historical Library. For those of you who don't realize it, Abraham Lincoln was from Illinois. Just kind of filling that gap for you, just in case you didn't know that. And as a result, the, 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 this painting of the First Lady of the United States during the Civil War then hung in the library. Well, someone looked at it and said, I'm not so sure about this. Took it down, started investigating it. But nothing really came out of that and said it passed hands and eventually ended up in the Illinois governor's mansion and it basically hung on the wall for almost 50 years. Until one day, as they were going through and they were kind of redesigning and redecorating, one of the the people looked at the painting and they said, that painting is kind of dingy and dirty. We need to clean it up. So they hired an art restorer who came in and did the work to kind of restore the artwork. And as they started restoring it, realized that they took the face of Mary Todd right off. And instead, it was a painting of someone completely different. It was a counterfeit. A counterfeit that stood the test of time and hung in the governor's mansion of Illinois for 50 years. People didn't question, think about this, right? 2010, 1929, who probably the, this guy who was, count, you know, not exactly on the up and up, those vaudeville guy, actors. So for almost 90 years, no one questioned, no one really thought to understand, and basically it was one of the most successful counterfeits, even though it wasn't one of the most valuable counterfeits. The world is full of counterfeits. We see it in money. We see it in artwork. The quote, the wise sage, Rick Harrison, if you know that name, that's where you laugh. That's one of the Pawn Star guys. He said, if anything has value, it is worth counterfeiting. We can, we can look at things that have value and sometimes realize as we hold it up and we say this has value for years and years and years to recognize that it becomes worthless. Paul, as he writes this letter to this group of Christians in the community of Ephesus, he urges these people, these Christians, these followers, to seek to imitate the only thing that has real value in this world. And that only thing that has any real value in this world is the love of Jesus Christ. Going back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, what Paul is doing is he is urging the readers of this letter to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that Christ has called them to. To walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. And Paul is urging them to do that. And in so, what he urges them to do throughout chapter 4 is he basically says he wants us to put off our old life and the foolishness of the world and put on a new life that is in Christ. He wants us to turn our backs on the falsehoods 
that come out of this life. He wants us to turn our back on the lies of the world. And man, aren't there a lot of lies in the world. You know, I remember when I graduated high school, I thought I had the world figured out. And the expectation for me when I graduated high school was that I was supposed to have it figured out. I was going to go to college. I was going to be a physical therapist. I had it all planned out. I was going to play college football. I had all these things kind of mapped out for my life. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and that's why I stand in Spring, Texas on a stage preaching to you on Sunday morning. See, here's the thing. That's one of the biggest lies this world has is that you can have it all and that you can have it all figured out. I realized that in, when I was 20, I thought I knew everything. And then when I turned 30, I realized that I didn't know anything. And now when I'm 40, I realize I know one thing. I'm still trying to figure out what that one thing is, but I'll tell you when I get there. But that's the thing, though, right, is that we think we have the world figured out. And this world tries to tell us all these falsehoods. They try to tell us things that we, we want to embody and understand, They tell us lies, like you deserve whatever it is, that you can have anything that you want, that you can live life to the fullest. Don't believe me? Just watch a television commercial. Everything that we learn today, everything we see, everything that is marketed to us today is basically said that you can have it all. You deserve this. You want this. You need this. You have to have this. In truth, that's the way the world wants to live. One of the most recently best-selling books in the self-help aisle, I can't quite quote the the title of the book, but it's it's the subtle art of not giving a blank. It's a, one of those words you're not supposed to say in church, or really ever, but if you kind of catch my drift, but it's mean, don't, don't give a care. And the whole idea is saying, how can you go through life not caring if someone does something mean to you? How do you get through life not caring if someone hurts you? How do you get through life not caring? How can I care less about things so that I don't get hurt so I can get more out of life? Does that bother you? Or are you looking it up on Amazon ready to buy it right now? Because it's one of those things. It's a lie. It's a lie that we're told that we're not supposed to care. We're also fed lies every day when we're told, when we look through our social media, whatever account or whatever we use, our platform of choosing, where basically it tells you and puts things in your way, stories that people would post, your friends post, having these intelligent computer programs, putting forward something that is going to make you angry or upset. It tells you what you're supposed to care about. And instead, what we get is a world that is a misrepresentation of what's actually going on in this world. I don't know what it says about me, but the computer really wants me to care about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, and I just don't want to. We live in a world of counterfeits and lies, and it should come as no surprise to us because this world that we live in is a fallen, broken world in which Satan has dominion over it. The father of lies the great deceiver. And he wants nothing more for us to be deceived and be decepted into thinking that there is something that is going to make our life more complete, that there is something that's going to make life better and great, that we can just have more peace, more love, more joy, more happiness than what there is. And Paul, his whole thing to this group of believers is saying, forget about the counterfeits. And if you remember, they lived in a culture that was based around one gigantic counterfeit. The temple of Artemis, in which everything would make sense. The entire economy of this whole community in Ephesus was built upon the worship of this, the, the goddess of the hunt. 
And in which you would come and you would worship, you would give money, you would you exchange sexual favors with temple prostitutes. This is what was the, all, the whole situation in Ephesus. To the point where they have this whole cottage industries in which they're making idols and selling them to people that were coming in and coming from miles and miles around. My life doesn't make any sense, so I'm going to go to the temple of Artemis and I'm going to get myself a magical little statue of Artemis and I'm going to carry it around with me, with me everywhere I would go. People would bind them to their foreheads, bind them to their wrists, bind them to their ship masts, wherever they would, they would go, whatever they were sailing, whatever the case would be, they would do everything they could because that was the one thing that made sense to them. And we sit here and go, well, it's absolute foolishness. Why would some little piece of silver make that much sense? But we sit there and point our fingers saying, why would that little piece of silver make so much sense? Or our idol might be sitting out in the parking lot in the form of an automobile. Or our idol of choice might be the house that we go home to. Or our idol of choice might be the pleasure that we seek. Whether it be distraction from the problems of the world through Netflix and all these other streaming platforms so that we can just forget our problems. Or perhaps maybe it's the fulfillment of drug, sex, or alcohol or whatever else the rock and roll industry that is now dead, which breaks my heart, has taught us over the years. What lies have you believed? What Paul is saying is forget all the lies. What you need to do if you want to have anything in this life that makes sense, anything of value, anything that is worth anything, what you need to be is an imitator of God. As beloved children, walking in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're called to be an imitator of Christ. I remember when I was a small child, and back in the 80s, it was a very popular thing to have imitation creamer for your coffee. I think it's still popular nowadays. It always freaks me out when you get something that's sold next to milk, but it doesn't go bad for like eight months. Still trying to figure that one out. Everything we believe is an imitation. If you go to McDonald's and the ice cream machine is actually working, realize it's not actually ice cream. Because there's not enough milk product in it to qualify it as ice cream. So next time you go to Dairy Queen or one of these places, Notice how it never says ice cream anywhere. It says soft serve or something else. Because it's an imitation. It's not the real thing. It imitates something. It looks like it. It tastes like it. It smells like it. And it imitates everything. And what we're called to be is an imitation of Christ. What we're called to do is be a facsimile of Christ. However, we can never live up to the real thing because how do we live up to the facsimile of God himself? How do we live up to that? We're not going to. And Christ understands that. But what he wants is for us is to walk after him, to chase after him, to follow in his footsteps and do our very best to imitate him. Not just because we just need to do these things and he's going to bless them. It has nothing to do with that at all. Paul has talked about that earlier in Ephesians chapter 2 because it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the fact that God sent his son to die on the cross and there's nothing that we can do. It's not a, a based on our works, but it's a based on Jesus Christ's work on the cross as a free gift for us to have. So we're called to walk in a manner worthy of Christ's love. We're w called to walk and be imitators of Christ. But the being an imitator of Christ is so very difficult and so counterintuitive to this culture. What does it mean to be an imitator of Christ? 
means to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Christ himself died being offered up as an offering to God for the sake of you and me. That you are not righteous, you are not worthy, but he loved you he said, in spite of all the issues and problems and things that you've done, I do not care because you are worth it. I want you. And if you accept that and accept to follow him, what he asks you to do is nothing less than what he has done before you, which is to stop focusing on the inner self and start focusing on, the other, on other people. Stop living your life for yourself and start living your life for Jesus Christ. And so giving yourself up as a sacrifice in the same way Jesus gave himself up for a sacrifice. Can you imagine what that would be like? Think about that. You're going to enlist in something, whether it be the military or the armed forces, and they basically say, what we can guarantee you is that you're going to be nailed to a cross Naked. Sounds like a good time. What do you want to join us? I don't know about you, but I'm not signing up for that. Unless you know the power of Jesus Christ. You see, here's the thing. What he is asking us to do is to imitate him in the way Christ imitates us. It imitates, uh, uh, as Christ gave us this 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 image of what it means to be self-sacrificing and putting self before him. And here's the problem. That becomes extremely difficult because we are selfish. That's the root of all sin comes out of selfishness. It's what I want. It's what I desire. It's what I need right now. When I was in high school, like every high school student does, is when it gets close to graduation and everything, you start thinking that you know your own rules. You're about to be 18, or maybe you are, were already 18. Start making your own rules. What do you need your parents for and everything like that? My parents did this great thing. What they did was is they, they, they basically said, we'll give you a car. My dad was always very clear. It was his second car wasn't my car. It was his second car. Now, I had unfettered access to this car. I can use it wherever I want. It was my car. I put the helmet decals from my football helmets on the back of it. I mean, I could do whatever I wanted to that car. It was my car, but it wasn't. And if I wanted to continue to have access to that car, I had to go by the rules of my parents. Well, you rebel. I don't want to go by the rules of my parents. So I started saying I had a little bit of money saved up. I was like, let's see what I can get for $1,000 in a vehicle. I was doing a lot better back then, not now. Oof. At least then you could get one that ran. I don't know about today. I have to get one they have to evict the rats from or something. But anyway, so, I, but this is the thing. I went through this whole thing, and I went through, I was going to buy a Dodge Intrepid. And I don't know if you know anything about cars, but it was one of the worst cars ever made in the history of mankind. And if you bought one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not making fun of you. It looked cool, but it was, it was, it was not. But I went through this whole process where I thought I could do all this, I can make sense out of it, and then I realized how much I had to pay insurance, and then living under my dad's rules weren't so bad anymore. But that's the thing, though, right? We rebel, we think, because it all was about me and what I wanted. I didn't want to listen to someone else. I didn't want to obey my parents anymore. I could make my own choices. I was 18. I could do whatever I want. At the heart of everything, we are selfish. And I wish I could tell you that I grew out of that, but I didn't. And you know that because you haven't grown out of it. The root of all sin comes from the selfish desires of our heart. What I want, when I want it, how I want it, and I don't want anybody to tell me otherwise. You know what the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ is? Is that he doesn't tell you you have to do this. He invites you to be a part of what he's doing. 
He invites you. He extends a hand. He offers a gift. Will we unwrap it? Or will we reject it? See, the beautiful thing about Christianity, and it's different from everything else in the world, is that there are no strings attached to God's love. There's nothing that you can do in this moment that would make, you, uh, make God love you any less. And there's nothing you could do in this moment that can make God love you any more. Because He already loves you the most. And because He already loves you the most, all He wants is to have a relationship with you. And He's done all the hard work and the difficult work. He has made it possible. He has paved the way. It's up to you if you want it. Or do we want our selfish desires? The original sin, Adam and Eve, what did they want? They wanted to know what it was like to be God. Ultimately, we've never grown out of that. We want to know what it's like to be God. And so we continue to choose and make our own choices. We're in control. We don't want to submit to anyone. And so the call is to walk in love as Christ loved us. So how do we start being imitators of Christ? It'll take us two weeks to get through all of this, but let me start us out here in verse 3. It says this, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you, as is proper among the saints. If you remember, saints is basically what it's called to be a Christian. Paul is writing to a group of people who are, have become Christians. They no longer recognize themselves as Jew or Gentile, but rather born again, walking in Christ. So how do we imitate Christ? What we do, we're called for sexual purity. It is one of the saddest things in the world to me to see how backwards this world has what a sexual relationship is supposed to look like. God created a sexual relationship to be in the bounds of marriage between one man and one woman. But the world is really good at counterfeiting. The world is really good about putting up facsimiles and things that that make things look good, that that make it seem like things would, would be okay and would be better. So it tells us, well, you know, the person of the opposite sex isn't fulfilling me. What if I try the same sex? Or maybe, why should I just bind myself to one person? For those of you who experienced a loving relationship and the true bounds of marriage, you know there's nothing more beautiful. And Paul will go into this and what that looks like in a marriage relationship here in weeks to come. But everything we're told in this world, you know, it's really interesting to see how things have shifted. I realize that I'm old, I've got a birthday in a week. It's not that like I'm going to be 41 and I'm like, ugh. It's like I'm not even just like, well, I just made it out of my 30s. I am now well into my 40s. I mean, I don't like it. I remember it was a big thing. When I was a kid, there was a movie. And it was, called, it was something like about, I can't remember the exact title of the movie. I, I thought about looking it up, but I just didn't really waste the brain power to it. I think Kristen Heigl was the main actress in it. Never saw it. But this big thing was about the number. It was the number of partners that someone had. And I remember how it would be a big deal for, for women to not have very many partners, but for men to have as many partners as possible in the 90s. And this is how I grew up with the expectation of it. And you sit there, you can't do the math because you're like, how can and the guys have lots and the women have little. It doesn't really work that way. You know what's interesting? Like I said, they made a major motion picture that focused on that exact topic. I haven't heard anybody talk about that in years. Because no one cares. Because it's all about what I want in this moment and in this time. It's all about what I need and what I expect and what I want. Sexual immorality, impurity, 
It all comes out of what we would call covetousness or basically wanting something that you're not supposed to have that belongs to someone else. And all these things are improper among the saints. Let me say it another way in another letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. If you remember the church in Corinth, the church in Corinth was a wild, crazy place. He said this. He used a little tongue and cheek. This cheek, I'm sorry. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says this. It says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Because there was a saying in the church in Corinth. It was kind of like the Las Vegas of the ancient world. You know, like that whole idea of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, in Corinth, it was all things are lawful or all things are acceptable, so why can't I do it? And so Paul uses this little thing. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. So that's the thing. We don't realize what sin does to us. And what it does, it traps us. And it makes us desire the thing that we want more and more and more. And every time we go to it, it leaves us more and more empty. So we have to take it a step farther. We have to make it a step bigger. We have to do something else to make it make more sense to us. Paul says this, he says in verse 13 here, he says, food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food. But God will destroy both one and other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. The Lord created you for him. But that's the thing. We use our bodies for what we want to rather than recognizing that God created us with a very specific purpose and that very specific purpose in mind and what we should be chasing after. Paul continues on here. and speed this along. Paul says in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, says, flee from sexual immorality for every other person commits uh, for every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But sexual immoral person uh, sins against his own body. I don't have time to unwrap all of that right now, but did you catch that? All other sin happens inside the body, but sexually, sexual immorality happens outside the body. All sin in God's eyes equals death. And separation from him. But not all sin is equal. There's something different about sexual sin that causes us to be trapped, that causes us to be enslaved. There's something else that's different about it. And if we are foolish enough to not think that it's no big deal when we look at an image on our phone screen, to think that something happens outside, that it is a huge deal. It is very enslaving. So we're not have, supposed to have these things named among us. See, it's the power of Christ that frees us from it, removes it from us. How do we be imitators of Christ? The second thing we need to be is we need to understand what the words that we say and the weight that they carry there's that old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. One of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. I mean that. Because words can hurt more than sticks and stones ever can. God's call for us is to use words that build up and not tear down. Yet the counterfeit in this world is telling us that we have to tear people down. As soon as we find out something about someone and we recognize that there is something that is, is out of line in their, in their world, doesn't, uh, in their worldview, what they've done, as soon as we find out, it negates all the good they've ever done and they must be canceled. We know that no one is righteous, not even one. And so as a result, when are you going to be canceled? When am I going to be canceled? Maybe I've already been canceled, I don't know. But are we going to be imitators of Christ? 
Because what God is calling us to do is calling us not only to live a sexually clean and pure life where we are set aside for Him and Him alone and let our bodies be used for Him, but also our lips be used in the same way. What we are called to do is speak words that are going to be uplifting. We are supposed to speak words that are full of thanksgiving. We are not supposed to speak words that are going to be crude. Our joking, is it that of... Things that are going to take people away from Christ? Or are they going to be things that are going to build up people in Christ? See, this whole, Paul is talking about this whole concept of coveting, this wanting, this selfishness in our own hearts. And our words, are they coming out as that of selfishness and things that we want and things that we desire that we're tearing down because these are what we want? Or are we going to be imitators of Christ because Christ built up? Here's the thing. I want you to see this and I want you to hear this. For you may be sure of this, verse 5 in Ephesians chapter 5, that everyone who is sexually immoral and impure, who is covetousness, that is an idolater, so the way you use your words, the way you use your body, if you use it to be pleasing yourself instead of God, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Do you have an inheritance in the kingdom of God today? Have you been adopted into His family? And is it time to put away these things? Or recognize this, that you may have no place in His kingdom. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Are you a son or daughter of disobedience? For the wrath of God comes to you and is poured out upon you. How do we get away from the wrath of God is accepting His forgiveness, kindness, and mercy. But it comes with cost. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Lou Bloom deceived a nation for 90 years. This painting hung on the wall of places that you and I don't exactly get to walk into every day. All because he was able to create a counterfeit. He was able to sell a lie. And the American people, they took it. Are you being deceived? Is your life plans and goals and ambitions, are you being deceived by the world and what they're advocating for? Or do you realize that maybe, just maybe, there needs to be something more? Do you have an inheritance or have you been deceived? If you've been deceived and you recognize that you need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, we're going to close in a song and I invite you to come and pray with me. If you're watching online, I invite you to go to our website and fill out an online form there. Just go connect with us and you just follow the prompts there and I'll be in touch with you personally. Maybe you've lived your entire life as a Christian. You've been walking in a manner and you realize that there's some things that have popped into your life. There's some things that you need to repent of. Impurity has crept in. Your words have not been that of thanksgiving, but rather of tearing down. Maybe you need to come and pray with me or pray at the altar here and change course and change direction. I don't know what it is, but the invitation is there. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are a great and amazing God that loves us dearly. And Lord, I pray that you would help us 
recognize if we have an inheritance in you or not. And Lord, I pray that hearts would be moved away from the lies and the foolishness of this world and move towards a life of fullness in you by imitating you. You are great and you are awesome and worthy to be praised. Pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. You stand. today. If you have an opportunity, like I said, we have two of the graduates in house. Uh, I hear Drew does have a plan. I just didn't want to make him put him on the spot here. Tyler, I didn't care. I just put you on the spot. So <laughs> anyway, so if you get a chance, let's uh, just uh, wish uh, Drew and Tyler a happy graduation here, and maybe they'll might share some of your, their plans with, uh, uh, with you. So also, if you get a chance to say congratulate Jazz Ghoul and the Burkettes, that would be really sweet as well. So let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, you have called us to something better than believing the lies of this world. And Lord, I pray that we would seek you and be imitators of you to find meaning and purpose rather than the lies of this world. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.